Question. A prim I graded with insulin-dependent diabetes client tells the nurse that the contraction stress test performed earlier in the day was suspicious. The nurse analyzes this test result as indicating that the fetal heart rate pattern revealed which of the following? 1. Inconsistent late decelerations. 2. Frequent late decelerations. 3. Decreased fetal movement. 4. Lack of fetal movement. Answer. Option 1 is correct. A contraction stress test is performed to evaluate fetal well-being during simulated labor. A suspicious contraction stress test demonstrates inconsistent, late deceleration patterns requiring further evaluation. A negative contraction stress test shows no late decelerations and is the desired outcome. A positive contraction stress test indicates fetal compromise with frequent late decelerations. Fetal movements are one of the parameters of a biophysical profile and are detected with non-stress testing. Declined or absent fetal movements may indicate central nervous system dysfunction or prematurity. Lack of fetal movement or decreased fetal movement is not associated with. Contraction stress testing. Question. A 25-year-old primigravid client with insulin. Dependent diabetes at 34 weeks gestation undergoes a non-stress test, documented as reactive. The nurse should assure the client that the test results indicate which of the following? 1. A contraction stress test should be done. 2. Chorionic villus sampling is necessary. 3. There is evidence of fetal well-being. 4. The non-stress test should be repeated. Answer. Option 3 is correct. A reactive non-stress test indicates fetal heart rate accelerations and well-being. The non-stress test is considered reactive when two or more fetal heart rate accelerations of at least 15 BPM occur from a baseline fetal heart rate of 120 to 160 BPM along with fetal movement during a 10 to 20 minute period. There is no indication for further evaluation, such as a contraction stress test. However, contraction stress tests are commonly scheduled for pregnant clients with insulin-dependent diabetes in the latter part of pregnancy and are repeated periodically until birth. Chorionic villus sampling is usually performed early in the pregnancy to detect fetal abnormalities. Question. A 29-year-old multigravid client at 7 weeks gestation has had a history of insulin-dependent diabetes since age 21. When educating about the importance of blood glucose control during pregnancy, the nurse should tell the client which of the following will occur regarding the client's insulin needs during the first trimester. 1. They will remain constant. 2. They will increase. 3. They will decrease. 4. They will be unpredictable. Answer. Option 3 is correct. In the first trimester, it is not unusual for insulin needs to decrease, commonly due to nausea and vomiting. Progressive insulin resistance is characteristic of pregnancy, particularly in the second half. It is not unusual for insulin needs to increase by as much as four times the non-pregnant dose after about the 24th week of gestation. This resistance is caused by the production of human placental lactogen, also called human chorionic somatotropin, by the placenta and other hormones, such as estrogen and progesterone, which are insulin antagonists. Question. A pregnant client with insulin-1-dependent diabetes and plans to breastfeed her neonate asks the nurse about insulin needs during the postpartum period. What statements about breastfeeding mother's postpartum insulin requirements should the nurse include in the explanation? 1. They remain the same as during the labor process. 2. They usually increase in the immediate postpartum period. 3. They need constant adjustment during the first 24 hours. 4. They fall significantly in the immediate postpartum period. Answer. Option 4 is correct. Insulin needs fall significantly for the first 24 hours postpartum because the client has usually been on nothing by mouth status for some time during labor and the labor process has used maternal glycogen stores. If the client breastfeeds, lower blood glucose levels decrease the insulin requirements. With insulin resistance gone, the client commonly needs little or no insulin during the immediate postpartum period. Although the need for insulin decreases during the intrapartum period, 
the insulin requirements fall further during the first 24 hours postpartum. After the first 24 hours postpartum, insulin requirements may fluctuate markedly, needing adjustment during the next few days as the mother's body returns to a non-pregnant state. Question. At 38 weeks gestation, a primigravid client with poorly controlled diabetes and severe preeclampsia is admitted for a cesarean birth. The nurse explains to the client that childbirth helps prevent the following. 1. Congenital anomalies. 2. Perinatal asphyxia. 3. Stillbirth. 4. Neonatal hyperbilirunemia. Answer. Option 3 is correct. Stillbirths caused by placental insufficiency increase frequency in women with diabetes and severe preeclampsia. Clients with poorly controlled diabetes may experience unexpected stillbirth due to premature placenta aging. Therefore, labor is commonly induced in these clients before term. If induction of labor fails, a cesarean section is necessary. Induction and cesarean section do not prevent neonatal hyperbilirunemia, congenital anomalies, or perinatal asphyxia. Question. A client with gestational diabetes entering her third trimester is learning to monitor her fetus's movements. After educating the client about the kick count, the nurse should provide further instruction if the client makes which of the following statements. 1. The baby may be more active at different times of the day. 2. How I feel my baby move is different than my friend. 3. The baby should be moving less than 10 times in 2 hours. 4. The baby may not move at times because it is asleep. Answer. Option 3 is correct. Feeling 4 kicks in 30 minutes or feeling 10 or more kicks in 2 hours are norms. Fetuses are more active at various times, particularly after a mother has eaten when the blood glucose level is increased and in the evening. Each individual perceives their fetus to move differently. Fetuses do sleep several times per day for about 30 minutes each time. Question. Which statements about a fetal biophysical profile would be incorporated into the teaching plan for a primigravid client with insulin-dependent diabetes? 1. It will correlate with the newborn's APAR score. 2. It determines fetal lung maturity. 3. It is non-invasive using real-time ultrasound. 4. It requires the client to have an empty bladder. Answer. Option 3 is correct. The fetal biophysical profile, a non-invasive real-time ultrasound test, assesses five parameters. Fetal heart rate reactivity. Fetal breathing movements. Gross fetal body movements. Fetal tone. Amniotic fluid volume. Fetal heart rate reactivity is determined by a non-stress test. The other four parameters are determined by ultrasound scanning. The results are available as soon as the test is completed and interpreted. The lecithin sphingomyelin ratio is used to determine fetal lung maturity. Although the fetal biophysical profile helps predict which fetuses may be at greater risk for compromise, there is no correlation with the newborn's APAR score. The biophysical score is sometimes referred to as the fetal APAR score. A score of 8 to 10 indicates fetal well-being. The use of ultrasound requires the mother to have a full bladder. Question. A nurse is educating a primigravid client with diabetes about common causes of hyperglycemia during pregnancy. Which of the following would the nurse include? 1. Fetal macrosomia. 2. Maternal infection. 3. Pregnancy-induced hypertension. 4. Obesity before conception. Answer. Option 2 is correct. Infection is the most common cause of maternal hyperglycemia and can lead to ketoacidosis, coma, and death. The client should inform the primary health care provider immediately if she experiences symptoms of an infection. Fetal macrosomia, obesity before conception, and pregnancy-induced hypertension are not associated with maternal hyperglycemia during pregnancy. Question. When making a teaching plan for a primigravid client with insulin, one dependent diabetes about monitoring blood glucose control and insulin dosages at home, which of the following does the nurse expect to include as a desired target range for blood glucose levels? 1 140 to 160 mg per DL 7.8 to 8.9 mmol per liter one hour after meals. 
240 to 60 mg per DL 2.2 to 3.3 mm per liter between 2 o'clock and 4 p.m. 370 to 100 mg per DL 3.3 to 5.6 mm per liter before meals and bedtime snacks. For 110 to 140 mg per DL 6.2 to 7.8 mm per liter before meals and bedtime snacks. Answer. Option 3 is correct. The idea is to maintain blood plasma glucose levels at 70 to 100 mg per DL 3.5 to 5.6 mm per liter before meals and bedtime snacks. Below 60 mg per DL 5.6 mmO per liter indicates hypoglycemia. A 110 to 140 mg per DL 6.2 to 7.8 mm per liter suggests hyperglycemia. The target range one hour after meals is 100 to 120 mg per DL 5.6 to 6.7 mm per liter. Question. After educating a diabetic prima gravida about symptoms of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, the nurse determines that the client understands the instruction when she says that hyperglycemia may be manifested by which of the following? 1. Pallor. 2. Dehydration. 3. Sweating. 4. Nervousness. Answer. Option 2 is correct. Dehydration, polyuria, fatigue, flushed hot skin, dry mouth, and drowsiness are manifestations of hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is a medical emergency and requires rapid action to contain maternal and fetal mortality. Pallor, sweating, and nervousness are early signs of hypoglycemia, not hyperglycemia. Question. A client with diabetes at 39 weeks gestation is seen in the high-risk clinic. The physician estimates that the fetus weighs at least 4,500 grams 10 pounds. The client asks, what causes the baby to be so large? The nurse's response is based on the understanding that fetal macrosomia is usually related to which of the following? 1. Fetal anomalies. 2. Family history of large infants. 3. Maternal hyperglycemia. 4. Maternal hypertension. Answer. Option 3 is correct. Poor control of the mother's diabetes mellitus has been involved in fetal macrosomia. When the mother is hyperglycemic, large amounts of amino acids, free fatty acids, and glucose are transferred to the fetus. Maternal insulin does not cross the placenta. The fetal pancreas responds by hypertrophy of the islet cells of the pancreas. The islet cells produce large amounts of insulin, which acts as a growth hormone. A family history of large infants usually is not the cause for large for gestational age fetuses in diabetic mothers. Maternal hypertension is associated with small for gestational age fetuses because of vasoconstriction of the maternal and placental blood vessels. Question. The nurse explains the complications of pregnancy that occur with diabetes to a primigravid client at 10 weeks gestation with a 5-year history of insulin-dependent diabetes. If stated by the client as a complication, which of the following indicates the need for additional teaching? 1. Candida albicans infection. 2. Polyhydromnios. 3. Preeclampsia. 4. Twin to twin transfer. Answer. Option 4 is correct. Pregnant clients with diabetes are not at greater risk for multifetal pregnancy and subsequent twin-to-twin -twin transfer unless they have undergone fertility treatments. The pregnant diabetic client is at higher risk for complications, such as infection, polyhydramnios, ketoacidosis, and preeclampsia than the pregnant non-diabetic client. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and watch playlist for more videos.